A very good afternoon to everyone uh, who's joining us here from uh, India and a very good noon to those of you who are joining us from, from Europe probably. My name is Samrat, I am uh, working for Euraccess and we are very proud to bring you another exciting uh, webinar on how to get published in peer reviewed journals. And uh, this is a, a year long series which we are doing in partnership with Taylor and Francis. And today our topic will be how one can increase one's research impact and promote one's findings on social media. So I guess probably many of you already have published something in their career or they are about to publish, but it just doesn't end with that, right? It's not only to get it published and out and, and read by your peers, but it's also about how can your research, your, um, you know, your topic, uh, the, the, um, topic you've been working on for years, how can it uh, have an impact on others, how it can it bring maybe some kind of societal changes and how can it have a larger outreach uh, beyond academia maybe. So I'm very proud, as I said, to have this webinar uh, hosted today in partnership with Taylor and Francis. And in this webinar we will explore tools and tactics that will be available to you afterwards and it will help you to promote your uh, research post-publication. Now it gives me immense pleasure to welcome our two guest speakers today. I start with Katie Thompson. A warm welcome to you, Katie. She's a senior marketing manager with 15 years of experience across a range of marketing roles at Taylor & Francis. Katie leads three marketing teams dedicated to supporting researchers in medicine, health, science and technology, and arts, humanity and social sciences, helping them to discover the right journals for their research and achieve their publishing goals. Our second speaker is John Somers. A very welcome to you also, John. John is working with academic institutions and consortia across the globe to support their authors to publish open access. And so I'll just now straight away give the floor to them. And uh, I'll end my, I'll just make uh, immediately uh, John, the presenter, so that he can share his slides with you. Brilliant, thank you very much, uh, Samrat. So can you just confirm that you can see the starter presentation slides that I've just shared, first of all? Yes. Perfect. Uh, excellent. Okay, so um, welcome everybody and thank you very much for having us. I'm, I'm sure I'll speak for Katie as well to say that it's a, it's a pleasure being here and we're looking forward to speaking to you today. Um, so we'll kick right off. <clears throat> so um, in the next hour or so, um, it's useful for you to know, um, in the next hour or so, it's useful um, to you and of course, <laughs> sorry, let me start again. Um, feel free to ask us any questions as we go along or feel free to wait until the end. Um, on the screen in front of you, you can see the agenda for today. So there's quite a few topics we're covering. Um, there'll be time for questions at the end, but do feel free to uh, to, to write them down and, and keep them in mind as well as we go along. In 2022, it's never been easier to create content. Researchers have a whole range of tools at their fingertips to instantly promote the papers they publish. Many of these tools are cheap, quick to implement, and allow authors to reach large communities of potential readers. This becomes even easier too when their work has been published open access. A major barrier to authors publicizing their research has been removed. However, it is a challenge too. More articles are being published than ever before, and the online world is awash with engaging content. Research has shown that readers online have an average attention span of approximately eight seconds. So any promotion authors do needs a clear hook to engage their audience really quickly. And even once they're engaged, readers digesting all the intricacies of the research is not guaranteed. With funders and institutions demanding more and more impact from the research they support, authors have to find a way to promote their work. They also need to support lots of different groups publishers included. So why should you promote your research? 
Here are just a few reasons promoting your research is beneficial. Many of these I'm sure you're familiar with, but we'll just go through some. Ensuring research is discovered by, peer, by peers or other researchers, allowing you and others to build upon meaningful breakthroughs, to deliver, uh, deliver value to your institution or research funder, to help with your career development, support dissemination of research to stakeholders such as policymakers and the general public, to justify the value of the research and of course to enable journal development. In 2018, Wellcome conducted the Wellcome Global Monitor, which looked at public attitudes to science across the globe. In November 2021, a new report was published which looked specifically at attitudes to science in light of the coronavirus pandemic. My intention is not to focus on the impact of COVID and how academic research is perceived, but to focus on the current state of public attitudes to science and how far we've come in the last few years. The footnote to that is that the pandemic has undoubtedly had an influence on that progress. For a little bit of additional context, the 2021 report findings are based on a survey of almost 120,000 members of the public in 113 countries and territories. So it's an extensive data set and the figures are truly global. I want to start with a quick interactive exercise that I think uh, that I'd like to invite you to have a go at. So on the left hand side of the screen in front of you, uh, on the side, there are four percentage values, and on the right, there are four statements. On a bit of paper or in your head, or however you'd like to do it, have a go at matching up the percentages to the statements. I've included letters A to D for the percentages and the numbers one to four for the statements to make it easier. And I'll just give it a pause there for, for 10 to 15 seconds for you to have a little look through, have a little read and for you to match up the statements. There's some really interesting statements there with percentages, so I'll be interested to, to see um, how well you get on and what you think they link to. Right, so we'll move on and see what you got. So here are the answers then. A matches up with statement one. 41% feel they know a little bit about science. B matches up with statement four. 6% feel they know a lot about science. C matches up with statement two. 16% feel they know nothing at all about science. And D matches up with statement three. 33% feel they don't know much about science. So that 6% is probably, strangely enough, the least important figure here. It likely represents people who have studied science extensively or those who work in a science related field. So that's quite a niche group. That number is likely to always be relatively small as a percentage of the general public surveyed due to the natural diversity in interest and expertise. What I really want to draw your attention to here is the fact that 33% of people feel they don't know much about science. Interestingly, in the data from 2018, this percentage value is exactly the same. So this really hasn't changed. 33% of people still feel they don't know much about science. This next slide shows how much those different groups of people trust in science and how that's changed between 2018 and the 2021 report. So the bars on the right of this graph represent those who feel they don't know much or anything about science. So that includes the 33% of people we saw on the last slide who feel they don't know much about science, plus the 16% who feel they don't know anything at all. So pulling those groups together, the two bars on the right of the graph show that despite the lack of knowledge, 
there has been an increase in how much they trust science from those surveyed in 2018, the dark bar, the dark blue bar, and those surveyed in 2020, the yellow bar. This is likely due to the huge boom in communication during the COVID pandemic. The volume of information readily available, the breadth of channels used to communicate it, and the effort made to explain this to the general public rather than just specialists. Now, of course, there is a caveat that this data is based on a self-assessment of how people trust science, and we know that disinformation could be a factor. In other words, some people may be trusting information that is not completely correct. However, generally speaking, these numbers are a good indicator of how changes in research communication have communicated to changing public attitudes to science for the better. So how this relates to you and your research is twofold. As I've just mentioned, communicating your research and how you go about it has a positive impact on the general public's attitude to science, which can only be a good thing. And there is an opportunity here to really shift the balance further between those who don't feel they know much and those who feel they know a lot. As you can see, the levels of trust are higher in those who feel they know more. So we've covered the why, now we're going to look at how you can promote your research. This is by no means a full guide, but we've tried to cover as much as possible and gone into a bit of detail on some things that will hopefully help if you're not sure where to start. So this author uh, published his research in the Journal of Educational Research in May 2015. We worked with him on a PR and promotion uh, campaign via social media. Uh, the article has featured on the Education Week blog and the news and analysis site, The Conversation. The author created an infographic and video abstract, all of which uh, we could include with his article on taylorandfrancisonline.com as a supplemental material. In uh, three months, his article was downloaded 1,671 times, reached over 28,000 people via social media, as well as being featured in the media mentioned. This has now reached over 2,200 downloads. We asked him to write an article for us on the approach he took, and I just wanted to read to you uh, a part of it. Publicising an article is work, but it is worth it. I have received more emails about my article in the past two months than I have about all my other work in the previous year. The university has invited me to visit because of my work and my students are more excited about research because they see the attention it is getting. Not every article I will write will be as interesting to the public, but I will definitely be working to do what I can to rustle up some interest in my work in the future. So this really goes to show how much of a difference research promotion can have. Obviously, this is a very successful example and won't happen on this scale every single time, but the potential and the support is absolutely there. So as you can see, there are many ways you can promote your research and we understand that it can be a little bit daunting trying to figure out which channels to use. So we're going to look and we're going to look at that shortly. Um, and we've also picked out a few key channels to talk to you about in a bit more detail, which you can uh, see outlined in yellow here. It's important to note as well, that not all of these will uh, be available to everyone, but at least a few of them will be. So there should be plenty of options to explore when thinking about where to start. So just to go through what's on the slide, institutional or subject re uh, repositories, conferences, uh, and we'll talk about that uh, at a conference um, tips and tricks a bit later, sharing your work as a preprint or sharing e-prints of your work after publication, if you've published in a subscription journal, sharing and signposting through teaching and workshops. And there are some formats like videos and podcasts uh, there are different reasons to use each of these and sometimes getting the right format is key. Policy briefing. 
if you feel your work is impactful and has potential to influence policy, then this is something to consider. Sharing via email or on a personal blog or website uh, can be helpful. Two big ones that Katie is going to go into more detail later, media and PR, as well as social media. And one that we find researchers tend to be less familiar with, SEO or search engine optimization, which I'm going to move on and talk to you more about now. So SEO uh, or search engine optimization is referred to here as the hidden channel because much of the work is done behind the scenes and it's not obvious to the user, but it's something that really every researcher should be thinking about once you get going and it's fairly easy to do. In a nutshell, SEO is about making uh, tweaks to the text on a website, or in this case, elements to do with your written research, in order to help it appear higher in search results when someone is researching that topic or related uh, topic or field. So I'll talk through a few different places you can optimize for the best results in search rankings rankings starting with uh, the top bubble and moving clockwise around this circle so keywords i this is a crucial first step authors need to identify the relevant keywords for their article and editors can assist them with doing this think about the search terms that someone would use to find the article google trends can help you identify how many times keywords and phrases are searched for the article title uh, this needs to be descriptive, but must contain a key phrase related to your topic. Google Scholar considers the length of a title, puts your keywords within the first 65 characters of the title. Uh, so the abstract. Similar to the above, it's important to include keywords and phrases in the abstract. Given there are more characters available here, it's also worth bringing in synonyms too. So headings, search engines will use headings within an article to index the structure and content of the paper. Include your article keywords wherever you possibly can here. Uh, inbound links, once an article is published, the more places an author promotes it, the better. Links to web pages, blogs, social media, and so on are all indexed by search engines and help to boost the article's position in search rankings. And finally, citations. Search engines add a lot of weight to article citations. Adding a citation and the link to previously published articles can boost the ranking of those papers and the new paper being published. So thinking about all the other channels I mentioned, how do you decide where to promote your research? There isn't a set template for this and it is and should be purely based on your specific goals and research findings. So I'm going to go through some tips to guide your thinking. If nobody is talking about your area of interest, you might want to create new content. Creating new blogs and social media channels are options here. If you want to find people who are already working within your area of interest, who will likely be interested in your research, you can look to join an established community or if there's a lot of information scattered all over the internet on your topic you may want to curate that content into a resource to grow the profile of your subject area the answer to what you're looking to achieve will define the channels you use katie is going to talk uh, a bit more later on how to make these decisions when it comes to social media and media because there's so many different platforms and channels you can use within that. I'm going to cover influencing policy followed by conferences before handing over to Katie. Getting research into Parliament is important for individual researchers. It's one of the ways to demonstrate the societal impact of, their, of a piece of research, which is high on the agenda of universities and research funders and will even be and will be even more important in the years to come governments are also increasingly asking higher education institutions to show how public money spent on research improves society 
policymakers themselves rely heavily on new, reliable and accessible knowledge. This is definitely one of the more time intensive areas for a researcher, but the benefits of their research and career from impacting policy are numerous. A lot of focus is on networking, understanding who the key policymakers are, the timelines for policy development, and getting known by decision makers. One of the things a researcher can do to create a policy brief, that's a short summary of their research paper outlining the key outcomes uh, from it that can affect government policy. Needless to say, this that this needs to be concise and easily understandable. It may also outline how the current proposed policy approach is failing and break down simple practical steps that should instead be implemented. Uh, these infographics are probably coming up quite uh, small with lots of text, but there is further information on, how, on Author Services website uh, about how to do this, and our team are always happy to help with any queries you might have. So although we are uh, seeing much less physical attendance at conferences these days, the same applies. Oh, Katie, uh, can you just check that you can still see my screen? I can't see your screen anymore. Oh, there we go. You're back. Oh, it's gone back. Apologies. Um, I'm not sure how that was, how long that was off for. Um, hopefully not too long. Um, just for so, a second. Yeah, Moment, yeah. We're just gone for a second. Oh, okay, okay, perfect. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay, so uh, conferences then. Um, so although we're seeing much less physical attendance at conferences these days, um, it's really important to, to bear these in mind, and they're still really uh, important um, as they apply to virtual ones as well. Um, so arrange meetings in advance so you don't miss out on any opportunities. Look for sessions that are related to your research to see if there may be opportunities to present your paper or to ask questions you need answers to. Social media is a powerful tool, which I'll, um, we'll talk more about shortly, uh, and you get the most out of it by using it before, conference, during, and also after the event. Find a poster session in which to present your research. This should constitute a short elevator pitch describing the key points. It shouldn't be too tech heavy, so as to make sure it's accessible and it should direct researchers to your article. So for the next section, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Katie, um, who's going to talk a little bit more about press releases and media. Great, thanks John. Um, so as John says, I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about press campaigns and social media, including some things you might want to consider when you think about which avenue might be right for your research. Oh, there we go. Um, so using press campaigns to get to a research article, uh, to get a research article into the media can be an effective way to help boost impact. It's a particularly useful tool if you want to reach readers beyond the research community, and it can really make the difference in taking research to a global level in reaching a generalist audience. The benefits of media work can include an increase in downloads, citations, and the opportunity to reach audiences who might not otherwise have been exposed to your research or subject specialism. It can provide a significant boost to your career and also increase exposure for your institution and your funder. However, a press campaign is not always the right avenue for your research. So over the next few slides, we're going to have a look at how you can decide on whether this is the right choice for you. This infographic shows the impact one recent article achieved with a press campaign that was run by the TNF Researcher Services press team. The press campaign resulted in 45 news features. Those 45 features are where a journalist has included a link to the original version of record of the research. So that 45 really just represents the tip of the iceberg, as you'd expect many more media mentions where the research wasn't specifically linked out to in this way. Ultimately, this article was downloaded more than 23,000 times and the campaign has secured an ongoing media platform for the author, who continued to receive interview requests for over a year after the article published. So it really helped him to establish himself in the media as an expert in his field. So we've seen that press campaigns can be the right channel, uh, but what do you need to think about to make this decision for your research? 
Firstly, on a really practical note, do you have the resources for a successful press campaign? An effective strategically placed campaign is time consuming for everyone involved and you need to be able to dedicate time and effort to maximise the chance of achieving positive results. If the campaign does gain traction, then you might have even more calls upon your time to respond to comments or requests for interviews. Secondly, you need a clear message. As I'm sure you can imagine, journalists receive hundreds of press releases a day. Your research needs to stand head and shoulders above this noise. If you struggle to explain your article to someone outside your discipline, it's likely it will be too complex for a press campaign. Uh, you need to make it easy for a journalist to immediately see how your research gives them a story. And finally, what impact could your research have? It can be challenging to communicate complex scientific concepts and results to a non-scientific audience. And sometimes miscommunication of research can be damaging or even dangerous if research is misunderstood or taken out of context. It's really important to bear in mind that if the research can't be communicated accurately and without ambiguity to a general audience, it might not be worth pursuing a press campaign. Press relations is just one tactic that we at Taylor and Francis use to market journal research. And sometimes another channel might be better placed to ensure the research reaches the right audience. With that note of caution taken into consideration, let's think a bit more about the second point. What research tends to make the news and how can you assess whether your research is likely to get the attention of a busy journalist? The press team at Taylor and Francis have several years of experience of knowing what does and doesn't tend to make the press. We recommend that broadly speaking, research which is of the most interest to the press typically falls into four main areas. Major discoveries, so that's scientific progress or a major breakthrough which will often be of interest to a wider audience, especially within a subject area that's accessible to a general audience. Second, impact on society, putting people at the centre of a story often helps make it far more relatable for a wider audience. Outlining the relevance for individuals or groups within society can help a journalist quickly identify how the research is newsworthy. Thirdly, recommendation for a change in practice. Often driving change takes a good deal more than one individual press campaign can achieve, but it can often help bolster progress in practice or policy and can be a really effective tool for accelerating that process. And lastly, timely topics. If you're able to add to a topic of key importance for journalists, it can help boost the visibility of your research and also provide a platform for which you can make the biggest positive difference. In addition to these themes, image and video content directly related to or collected during the research is a huge advantage to a press campaign. This type of content can really make a big difference, so always let your press office know if you have this. Um, on this slide, I'm going to talk you through some of the things to avoid or consider adjusting when working on a press campaign. If research is already published, it can be a major disadvantage. Journalists usually prefer to cover breaking news. So if an article is already published, it vastly reduces its chance of making the cut. All TNF press campaigns are presented to journalists under embargo. This offers them a window of time before the article publishes for them to research their story and ask questions of the author. So if you think your article might be of interest to the press, please do speak to us about it early in the publishing process. The ideal time is once it's been through peer review, accepted to a journal, um, but before it has reached final proof stage. If a paper is of wider interest, but it doesn't offer anything novel for journalists to cover, it can be a bit more challenging to pitch to the media. Niche research. If the research focuses on a very specific uh, region of the world, a group of people or a very specific subject area, it can make it less likely to be picked up by mainstream journalists. Depending on the findings of the research, there are other tactics we'd advise employing in this situation. Pitching research directly via a regional media centre, for example, the Australian Science Media Centre, or working with your institutional press office, who will have more local press contacts on the ground, are examples of different methods to the traditional press release, which can be far more effective for this type of study. 
Um, sample size is really important, and many journalists will question this. Larger scale or longer term studies, which have strong evidence base, are much more likely to grab journalists' attention than something smaller scale where the study is not yet mature. If your research is still at quite an early stage, it might be worth considering developing this further within your research discipline before presenting it to a broader audience as a media campaign. And having no one available to answer questions about your breaking research will be considered a, bis a big disadvantage by journalists. Having someone close to the research available to provide additional comments is important to reporters who will want to have their own take on the story. When working with the press office on a forthcoming campaign, make sure that you've agreed on a convenient date and time of the embargo period so that someone will definitely be available to take those calls or attend those interviews. So where do you start if you feel you have a piece of research which is likely to make a successful press campaign? The process at Taylor and Francis is to submit a press nomination form. This can be found on our author services website and it's a simple form which enables you as lead author to notify us in the TNF press office about your study and offer key information about the research which will help us assess it and set up on a strategy to best take it to the media. The press team will get back to you once they've reviewed the form and spent some time looking at the research. If it is taken forward as a campaign, the press team would then be in regular contact with you to get everything agreed for the press release, including a launch date. Once the embargo period starts, the press team are often contacted for a copy of the study and you might be contacted for comments or interviews. After the embargo lifts, the article will publish and hopefully you'll start to see news coverage. You may also find that your research institution also has a press office who can help offer you advice and guidance. If you would like to find out more about promoting your research to the media, there's a wide range of different resources that can be found online. The Taylor and Francis Author Services site covers a lot of what we've talked about today, and you'll find resources with advice on the press release process and guidance on how to engage with the media, including tips from media experts. One of the big barriers we hear from authors who feel cautious about working with the media is that they're concerned that press activity will attract criticism around their article. If you or a colleague become a victim of online harassment, we have advice on the author services site on how to deal with this. The Taylor and Francis press team are also very happy to help advise and answer any questions you have, and you can get in touch with them via the email on the slide. Uh, as mentioned previously, many institutional press offices are very happy to offer advice as well. Uh, and there may also be many regionally based media centres which can offer lots of guidance, so we would recommend looking into those. <coughs> Um, I'm going to take a few minutes to look at social media, um, as this is one of the most accessible ways to promote your research and interact with people who are interested in your work. A question we often get asked is why use social media? And these quotes highlight some of the key reasons. Social media can be a really great avenue for discovering and interacting with interested audiences. That audience might be a group of researchers you can network with, or it might be a wider group where you can help a general audience better understand the importance of trusted scientific research. And if people are going to talk about your area of expertise or your research in particular, then why not be an active part of that conversation? So breaking this down into the specific benefits of using social media, um, and just to add that these bullet points cover more than just the sharing of your research, but it's important to paint the full picture here. So first of all, it's a great platform through which you can connect with other academics in your field. It allows you to ask questions within that community. It has huge power to help spread the word about the research you're undertaking. And then the focus of the conversation today, it allows you to publicise your article, increasing downloads and citations over time and impact. And it's also a powerful tool that we can use to fight disinformation. What should you think about before launching straight into posting about your research on social media? So think about who your audience are. Are you looking for other academics in the same field to network with? 
or are you looking for a general audience and want to build on their interest in the subject area? Think about where your audience already are. It's hard work to create a brand new online community. So do some research and join in with established groups on key social networks. And think about what your message is. What kind of tone will you use? Are you going to engage in popular conversations and trending hashtags, post images or produce video content? Finally, think about how you're going to measure success. What would you like to achieve by the end of your first month? and the end of your first year. Um, and now we're gonna have a little look at value and risk and social media. So there's real value in finding and engaging your audience on social, but it's also worth acknowledging that there can be an element of risk. You can learn a huge amount about the people that you want to reach just by watching conversations and interacting with others. The risks are largely around not being able to invest in it properly or when things happen outside your control. I'm sure we've all seen instances on social media where opinions or intentions have been misunderstood or misinterpreted by others, and this can sometimes have far reaching consequences. If you have a firm plan in place for how you're going to post on social, reach your audiences and deal with any problems, then you're in a good position. This next slide outlines a few quick tips. Um, so create interesting content. Don't try to communicate your research in too much detail. Think about how to spark someone's interest in your research or subject, then link through to more detailed findings or discussion. Be social. Remember that you don't need to be everywhere doing everything, just in the right places where your audience is. Social media is like talking in a very crowded room. So it's important to identify and put effort into speaking to the right people, but take some time to find the right people to engage with. Plan ahead. Social media and content creation should be a good experience. You don't want to take the joy out of engaging with other people in a spontaneous way, but you do want to make sure that you're dedicating regular time to develop your social media presence. Sporadic posting will be unlikely to lead to much return engagement, so make sure you have small but regular chunks of time where you read, listen, like, reply and post within your chosen communities. And now I'm going to hand you back to John, who's going to look at some further resources and training. Thanks, Katie. Uh, yes, as, as Katie mentioned, um, I'm going to take a couple of slides now to talk about further reading and some resources um, that you can take away um, if you'd like to explore this in more, more detail. So uh, barriers to public engagement. Uh, yeah, these are the reasons researchers feel unequipped to participate in the public in, uh, in public engagement. The data on the slide is taken from a slightly older welcome survey based on UK researchers, uh, but I believe the information is still very relatable. Uh, you can see that a lack of training and a lack of experience are the major issues listed by 60% of respondents. These are areas that I've tried to address at the top level today and are the basis for, you, uh, for the res resources and training selection I've covered, but also what I'm about to show you now. I hope that if these barriers are familiar to you, in some way it's comforting to know that you are very much not alone in this and there is help available to you once you know where to look. So author services. A Taylor and Francis website uh, containing a host of information to support our author community. Part of the website is dedicated to post publication support and features advice to support authors across the channels outlined earlier. Obviously, I, I am biased, but this really is a great place to find information and tools to support your research journey. Institutions also offer uh, their research offices um, support as well. This screenshot shot taken from the University of California's website, but many institutions do do similar uh, and offer similar resources. YouTube tutorials um, by other academics. The PhD Diaries is another such channel following a researcher as she navigates the world of research and publishing, but there's lots of other similar peer-to-peer -peer channels. Funders, uh, so welcome uh, as an example. Uh, but many offer support and training to recipients of their grants. Welcome actually have an online course that their researchers can complete. 
There are also podcasts and webinars uh, to offer support. Taylor and Francis have a How Researchers Change the World podcast series, which features key publications and real world impact of that research. As well as that podcast, there are also two online learning programs, one tailored to early career researchers and one tailored to mid-career researchers, offering them training and support to grow their research profile and ensure their work has impact. Finally, community blogs and online forums are another great resource for researchers to ask questions and receive support from their peers. The screenshotted example is from a biomechanics forum, but you will no doubt be aware of other such communities within your subject areas. I mentioned there are two learning programs as part of our How Researchers Change the World podcast series. This is just a screenshot of those with a link for you. Um, so when you have the, uh, this afterwards, you can go and, and find it. These programs are free and are delivered online for 12 weeks. You can find out more and sign up using the link on this screen. This is just an example view of one of our sections on our Author Services website which is designed to support you through every stage of your publishing um, journey and, and your research um, promotion. And of course, if you can't find what you're looking for, you can always reach out to us directly. Um, which brings me on to the final slide that we have of this uh, presentation of this information, which has our information for you to reach out directly. And um, so with that, I'll thank you um, for your time um, going through this with us today. Um, and I'll ask for any questions um, that people might have um, and we'll do our best to, to answer them for you. Thank you so much, uh, Katie and John. Uh, I think a very, uh, very good presentation, uh, very clearly structured and giving a good overview about, you know, the different aspects uh, for researchers to go out into the public. And also, I like very much uh, the beginning of the presentation, John, where you were talking about the um, effects of uh, COVID and how the uh, perception on science has changed and uh, also of course uh, I think it was very interesting to hear from Katie about also the social media part and also the risks which are also involved you know when you go out with your research and what kind of feedback can come back um, to, to one's research. Uh, so we have now uh, a good amount of time for taking uh, some questions from the audience and already I see that in our chat box there are um, already questions coming in just uh, for all of you who are listening to us don't worry uh, we will share also a recording of this webinar with you you will get your attendance certificates and we will also share the presentations uh, with you after the webinar but let's start with the first uh, question um, it was uh, I it's a tour to John um, John, there is one question about uh, uh, regarding preprints. Uh, sometimes the supervisors do not allow this for their grade students, in spite of the journal policy allowing it to be done. What can we do in those cases as a student if we want to promote our articles via preprints? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, and that's, I think, the first time I've heard that it's not been allowed, um, to be honest. Um, when we've spoken to authors before, this is this is something that we've seen to be allowed. Um, I'd be intrigued to know why they don't allow it. Um, I don't know, Katie. Do you do you have any any answer to that? It's a difficult one. I would say that um, the best thing that you can do there is to start doing that research behind who you want to talk to, where your community is, start planning what you do want to do kind of ahead of time for when your article is available and you can kind of link people back to it. So yeah, I would say if that's not something that's possible for you to do, then spend your time in that planning. As we kind of went through on those slides, planning what you want to do is really important to make sure that you're getting to the right communities and you're thinking about who you want to talk to and what you want to say. Um, so yeah, I think that would be my advice in that situation. Okay. Uh, another, another question uh, to Katie. Uh, 
on the usage of social media, is there a specific outlet that is best suited for promoting research? For example, is Twitter, would you say generally better than Facebook or LinkedIn? And so, also, the, the and, and just to, to, to end the question, uh, also, I'm never really sure whether Instagram is good for sharing research. So I'm curious to see uh, the Instagram, I, I'm, so I'm curious to see the Instagram logo in your slide. Absolutely. So we use all four of those um, social channels that you just mentioned. So I would say that at Taylor and Francis, we probably, uh, this is a bit anecdotal, but we probably find that Twitter and LinkedIn are the two channels where we get the most engagement. We use Facebook a little bit. We do find, again, this is kind of anecdotal. We're looking at um, kind of quantifying these feelings a bit more, but we feel like Facebook is much more um where academics still kind of keeps that for social like personal kind of keeping up with friends and family whereas people are much more engaged in kind of work spheres obviously on linkedin but also on twitter um so they're the two channels that we probably use the most um in terms of instagram we do dabble in instagram we have a taylor and francis science instagram page i would say that instagram can be fantastic depending on what your research is about. So Instagram is obviously mm. very visually led. If you have some kind of visual element, whether that's pictures of you having conducted your research or some kind of output that has that kind of visual format to it, then I would say Instagram is definitely a place where you can find a community that are interested in that. So it's very much down to how your research is constructed, what it's on, what the output is, what the process was, on to whether to use Instagram, but it can be really effective. But I would say if you're dabbling in it and you're trying things out for the first time, Twitter and LinkedIn are where I would suggest looking for those communities and thinking about what groups you might want to join, what people you might want to engage with, and I would start there first. Yeah, just, just to add to what we had on the previous slide as well, uh, that it takes a little bit of research from you to find out if these communities exist and if one doesn't exist yeah. then feel free to start one you know you, you could be that person that starts that community you could be the person that kind of answers that question for a few other people in your field True. who are also looking for communities and thinking about True. where that is best placed uh, might take a little bit of research as Katie said if it is very visual and very um, um, kind of engaging on, on lends itself well to that side then instagram might be that place to set that up um but also twitter and linkedin as well are, are, are good and are set up for those kind of professional community spaces and i think also the social media platforms allow the researcher to be also very innov innovative and creative right with mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. promoting his findings Absolutely. so it, and it depends also which personality you also are. Are you more like a uh, you know, Facebook person? Yeah. Are you more an Instagram person? And yeah. you know which audience you want to reach also, which age group you want to reach. I think that you know Instagram is more for, for a younger crowd, I, I would say. I'm not a yeah. it's a very good point. Though, but, it's a very good point, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's let's move on because uh, I'm seeing in the in the Q and A box many more questions are coming in, but uh, um there's one question about youtube um can we show both open access papers and subscripted ones on our own youtube channel uh, to go through our findings with the audience is it allowed without copyright breach um i would have to double check but yes i believe so if that um i think that sounds like that's the author kind of wanting to discuss their findings we have done yep. before called video abstracts and things like that, where we've done them, I believe, for both open access um, and subscription content. Um, but absolutely, yeah, I think that's a really interesting way of someone, um, as we were discussing before, kind of making their research accessible. And many people choose to consume content in that format and would rather watch a three minute video rather than read the abstract mm -hmm. of the paper, all of that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm sure it is. Um, and video is a really great way to engage your audience. It, it consistently scores really highly with engaging with audiences. So, um, yeah, I, I'd say absolutely um, do share your research through through that means if if that's if you're comfortable doing that and you're happy to do that and you have an established channel, which it sounds like you do. 
Okay. Um, another question was, um, could you sh please share some insights about video articles and video abstracts? Like, is there any kind of training or tutorial on that offered okay. by Taylor and Francis? Yes, we have done them in the past. I, oh gosh, I can't remember. I don't know if you can remember, John. I would say that um, the Author Services website that you can see on the screen at the moment is the best place to find guidance on that kind of thing. But as we were just saying, lots of people choose to consume content in the form of video. So I think that a video abstract is a really great way to do that. Um, but yeah, have a look on the Taylor and Francis Author Services site. Okay. Um, there's one question about um, about creating a policy brief. Is there any guidelines on that available? Like, if you want to create policy briefs about your research, Again, do you have any recommendations on that? I, I would say like if the, the <laughs> site, we have <laughs> so much information on there that I'm certain there'll be policy documents on there about how to do that and you know what kind of structure to use and all of that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Another question. I think it was already partly uh, addressed by John. Was um, uh, one of the uh, attendees is asking, "What is your opinion about creating a platform for researchers so that other researchers can freely comment on published articles?" Uh, I, I would say, yeah, yeah. Do it. I, it takes a little bit of research on your part, and it sounds like maybe you you have done that research to kind of figure out if one exists already um but if you feel it's not answering the questions or fulfilling a need that you see then absolutely set up one that does um it sounds like yours you know you want free conversation to flow which is absolutely great and you know we, we would support that and engaging with your communities is something that you know is yeah. what knowledge and sharing information research is all about right so i i would be all for that and in, encourage you to do that and um, perhaps the thought that's needed there is where and what would be the best place for that where are your communities are they mm. are they on places like linkedin or do they have or you know places on youtube for this are there there similar kind of videos similar kind of channels on there or is, is, is it a twitter or, or an instagram maybe if you're kind of going for the, um kind of that visual and um, perhaps younger crowd as, as you put it um but i'd say do it yeah absolutely Great. Uh, a few more questions. Let's take them. Uh, I have my research article published without open access. Is it okay to share the figures in my research gate profile for better visibility? I believe so, yes. Um, I don't see any problem with sharing some of the kind of top level research findings. That's absolutely fine. And I think that's an important part of what you were want to do on any kind of platform or um, social channel, I think it's absolutely fine to talk about those top level results. Yeah, what we don't want as a publisher and, you know, when you publish your research, what we're not saying to authors is that you never have to speak about it again because you published it. You have to remain yeah. silent. So it's only yeah. a different way of communicating it kind of via, you know, friends or whatever, where you're just talking about your research and the findings and kind of that key snapshot that you're saying so absolutely um but yeah you know link link out to the article as well so if people find those numbers really interesting they can find the context of those figures and find what went into the new methodology behind that as well yeah um uh, there's a question regarding the timeline for publishing a paper at Taylor and Francis. I don't know if, if you guys are the right ones to uh, address that question or do you have an insight on that? Like, what is the timeline? It's very, very variable from journal to journal. So um, some journals, it can be very quick. They have very quick turnaround times and other ones, quite often it's down to kind of the nature of the subject area. We find we have slightly longer turnaround times in um, arts, humanities and social sciences and things like that, just because of the nature of those journals, um, but very variable. 
So um, I would say if you have a specific journal that you've identified that you're interested in publishing, have a look on the website. Sometimes those journals have um, uh, an average uh, time to publication, so you can get a feel for how long that might take to process that article. Um, and often the academic editors um, are happy to be contacted. So if you have any really specific questions about publishing in that particular journal, you can frequently reach out to the academic editor and talk to them about it. Yeah. Mm, okay. Uh, there is one more question uh, about uh, how should one address the constant push for filing patents rather than publishing one's work? Seems that there is also, you know, in in academia, there is a strong urge, you know, to to file for patents. Um, so, any any observation or experience with that? Well, I don't have a lot of experience with that. I don't know if you've got anything there, John. Yeah, I, I don't think. From my advice, maybe would be best place to to advise you on that. Really, um, perhaps your I don't know where you're getting the pressure for patents. I, I would ask, and maybe your institution ask ask those ask peers um, if they feel the same and um, their advice yeah. um, about um, those patents and, and where they're coming from and who's getting who's pressuring you to to do that. Um, I would say maybe you know these communities of academics that you're you're built, bringing together through your research. Perhaps that's a good conversation um, within those as well. Um, but I don't. I would be best placed to advise on that being kind of slightly outside. Yeah, I think that's a very yeah, I think that's a very uh, complex question, right? Uh, mm. But I just I just thought to to share it with you uh, because I also don't really have an answer on that. Um, another question just came in, uh, Katie and John. Uh, what would you say about sharing a pu published article that is not open access via request from specific researchers, like you know, like um, um what what should one do when other researchers are asking for my article for my book chapter which absolutely so at Taylor and francis we offer oh i can't remember how many it is now is it 60 free e-prints that you can send off to people for that specific reason so um individuals contacting you to say i see this article i don't have access to it can i read it you do have that you can do that as your um become a published author with uh, author with Taylor and Francis, then you get um, a section of our website, My Authored Works, um, and that keeps um, all of the information about everything that you've published with us as a publisher. Um, it allows you to download those links so that you can send them to interested colleagues, um, and it tells you stats about how much your article has been read and downloaded and cited and all of that kind of thing. So it's absolutely possible to do that. Okay. Um, here is um, another question from uh, one of our attendees. Uh, she's saying, uh, I have a colleague who received an email that her paper has been accepted for publication by the journal. But the moment mm -hmm. she went to check on the homepage of the journal, she saw that the, the articles don't go undergo any peer review. Is it okay? To proceed for payment in this kind of journal for publication like what is your advice on that um i would say i don't know without looking at the journal every single journal that taylor and francis publish has a rigorous peer review process um i personally would probably be um quite cautious about publishing um with a journal that doesn't have a peer review process. There are different ways that peer review can happen. So at Taylor and Francis, the majority of our journals um, do that pre-publication peer review. We have um, kind of a new arm of the company called um, F1000 Research, where they do the peer review process differently, and that's an open peer review process. So your article is accepted and published on the website, and then the peer review process happens at that point and it's all open and you can see the kind of comments from the reviewers um so there are different mm. models for peer review i would be cautious and hesitant about publishing in a journal that doesn't have a peer review process at all i i would second yeah. that i'd be i'd be cautious as well i think a reputable journal and a reputable publisher would be very open 
about their peer review policy and even if as katie says our new arm of f1000 who, who kind of does it open and, and after publication they're very open about that and they're very clear and they make it very transparent so you can see where articles have been peer reviewed what the peer reviewers are saying and the replies to that so i would if, if there's any part of you that's in doubt i think you you probably got the answer right there really um and i if you want to be sure i'd probably go back and check that journal or that publisher and make have a look at their peer review policy if it's there if it's in any way questionable to you i'd, I'd be probably a bit dubious if i were you and and question that Thank you. Thank you for a very, very uh, important uh, question, and I think your very uh, answer was very, very good on that. Um, I think uh, we try to cover most of the questions in the chat now, and um, if there are any pressing questions uh, in the audience, this is your chance. You know, Katie and John are here with us live right now, so we can take a few more uh, minutes with them. Otherwise, if um, if you don't have any questions at the moment, you of course can you know um, send your queries uh, to both John, Katie, or to us, and we will be happy to help you further, uh, you know, with with your uh, uh, questions. So I'm just looking in the question. I don't see anything uh, more coming up. So then I would just say um, thank you so much. Katie and John, it was a very exciting and interesting session, and I'm sure that our attendees were also uh, seeing it in uh, the same way as I did. And um, I just again remind you that we will uh, share the recordings of the presentation with you afterwards, and um, you you know have the possibility also to send us your questions if you don't you know right now can think of any uh, questions, but I'm sure you have more questions uh, in your uh, heads. So with that, uh, I conclude uh, the session and uh, wish you all a nice uh, late afternoon here in India and uh, I think lunchtime or is it already post lunch? Very in the UK? just about lunchtime, yeah. <laughs> so so we, don't, we don't keep you longer away from, from your lunch break, well deserved lunch break both. And uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you so much and yeah, have a nice day ahead of you. Okay, thank Thanks. you, bye. Thanks, pleasure Thanks, to talk to you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.